Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. So you're sitting there on a Monday afternoon and you're watching soap operas, trying to figure out what you're going to do since you're not getting any hits on the job search that you have going on. All of a sudden, a school pops up during a commercial break that seems pretty luring. You figure, well, I'm going to go ahead and give them a call to see if perhaps I can change my life. After all, a lot of times what they do is they dangle all the education they're going to give you, and then at the end of the road you're going to have this magnificent job or career, should we say, that's going to completely change your life. Well, rarely do you hear during any of these commercials something about the technology field. I was sure they dabble in it if you want to repair microwave ovens and refrigerators, but what about an area that could probably take you to heights that you never believed were possible? On the Beyond 50 radio program today, we're going to be joined by someone who served in the United States Navy as both an electronics technician, first class. He also worked aboard nuclear-powered ships, generating and maintaining the nuclear power plant, and also taught computer theory, electronics, physics, chemistry, and more to incoming nuclear power trainees. He has also worked as a manager, business owner, and consultant writer and software developer. He started what is known as Tech Academy Portland, and he's going to be talking with us today about how you can possibly transition into the technology field and what that can do for you. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today our guest, Eric Gross. Eric, thank you for joining us here on the program today. Thank you, Daniel, and I don't know how I could possibly follow up an introduction like that. That guy you described sounds pretty cool. (laughs) <laughs> well, you know, I didn't sit there watching those soaps and thinking, how to be a radio broadcasting host. <laughs> they just don't teach things like that, but certainly there are schools that promise a lot of things. And You know, that's the thing that you're seeing is all these little individual schools and academies and colleges, and I was just talking with someone the other day about that and how it's interesting that, for instance, and I know this is kind of a negative side of things and, and, and mm-hmm. certainly doesn't apply to you, but... You know, you go to one of these colleges that promise that career at the end of the rainbow, and the bottom line is, you know, only certain people actually graduate through these colleges, and even less actually get that career at the end of the educational cycle. You know, so you kind of wonder, what are they in it for? And it seems to me that they're just in it to get the student loans, whether you finish or not, because that's what they're going to do is just enjoy the fact that they've got this cash cow going on. But you're not about that. You're actually about changing lives. Tell us about that. Well, we, we are, and I, I do want to just address directly um, what you observed in terms of the, call it, career education field that's out there. Uh, it, it, it encompasses both the conventional go to school at a college for four years and get a degree, but also some of the career schools that are a little more specialized in areas like being a you know, um, a nursing assistant or working in the medical transition field or um, hairstylist, that sort of thing. There's a whole, like, adult career education field. And while I can't really speak to the motivations of the people behind the schools, what I can speak to, having dealt with, you know, in this industry for quite a while, is the end result. And it is really a hit or miss. Some of the people that come out of those schools do quite well. The vast majority, though, don't see let's say there's a real fancy word, the remuneration, like what you get back from it monetarily that maybe they expected. And it's a frustrating thing. I have, a, I have someone that signed up for our school, and I'll, I'll talk about the school in a moment, who is saddled. This is an extreme case, but she's got a doctorate. Um, she's a master's in, um, in acupuncture and Eastern medicine, and she's also got a regular four-year degree underneath that. She's got a quarter of a million dollars in student debt. Wow. Right. Now, she chose this last burst of education, took her about two and a half years while she was maintaining a a regular job, because she thought it would, you know, catapult her into an earning potential of, you know, of six figures, you know, being able to make $100,000 or more as a a doctor. She's making $30,000 a year. And so there you are, you know, a a good person went into this field out of a desire to help and also to make a good living, and instead you're, you're making what? you know, a third of what you need to make. $30,000 doesn't go very far. You've got a quarter of a million dollars in debt. And I know that's an extreme case, but the point is that you do really need to look closely if you're considering transitioning to their career. What are the different educational options, and how do they serve me as an, as an adult, as an experienced working professional? 
rather than, you know, the 18-year-old comes straight out of school, in high school, and, and maybe has a different route. So mm -hmm. I just want to speak to that because we do see that quite often in the students who apply for our school. Well, that it's really difficult, too, as you use that particular example of, uh, you know, the natural healing arts, which, of course, has better footing than it did 15 years ago. Right, but the sure. fact is, is you know, we talk with a lot of these kind of people that come out of those schools, and they don't know how do I go about getting people to come in and see me in the first place. <laughs> you know? yep. And so there's a lot of challenges just with that alone. And it, you know, it isn't typical of like your regular medical doctor who excels well in say Harvard University and mm -hmm. you know gets his choice of hospitals at a high cap salary all at the same time. You know, there's right. a different field, and it's interesting because. When people actually, I think, tend to bite on these commercials, and we're not saying they're doing anything malicious, but, you know, are they really motivated by, geez, that's the way I want to serve life, or is it motivated by the allure of, wow, I can make a lot more money or at least have a job, which is something I don't have, you know, and so they don't really consider really looking into why do I want to be motivated by doing this. Mm -hmm. so. Absolutely. Now, tell us about your school. I think what was really intriguing was what you told me when it came to software development that, you know, it doesn't take all the math and the brainiac brain power that I thought that it did, and I found that to be very encouraging for a lot of people out there that, you know, because you take a look at what's going, you know, around online, you know, that more people are building online businesses. And I would think that having, you know, a software background might be something that can actually elevate that skill to a whole new level that you couldn't even imagine, but you even go further than that. Yeah, we absolutely do. And I really appreciate what you brought up about the, the idea that learning to code or learning to program computers is like the province of, of geeks and nerds. Now, don't get me wrong, I am a self-confessed geek and nerd and, and proud of it. But what I mean by that is, there's been a perception for way too long that it's the kind of thing where you need tremendously heavy math skills and, you know, you're really, you know, buried heads down in a, you know, dim room writing code all by yourself for eight hours a day or 12 hours a day or something absurd like this. And the fact of the matter is the technology industry is a rich, vibrant industry with a tremendous number of roles that are necessary for it to move forward. And it, can, it takes people of all different types of skill and interpersonal relationship abilities and mathematics and engineering and, and process management and, and all sorts of disciplines to make it work. Mm -hmm. And the fact of the matter is it's a field that's actually open to almost anybody. What we've found in our school is that if you are a reasonably bright person who's nice, you're going to do fine in this industry. You don't need the heavy math background, the nerdy, geeky kind of kind of stuff that we've come to expect from that industry over the years. So just to reiterate to our listeners, what Eric mm -hmm. just told us is you just have to be nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I kind of like that as a prerequisite. <laughs> just great? be nice. Boy, I could, I could see some people in the restaurant industry that should really follow that <laughs> philosophy. <laughs> yeah, it, it, is, it, is, it is a funny thing to, to look at and and I, I, I'm, I like to joke as much as the next guy, but it is something that we, we actually put a lot of importance on in our school. And by the way, I keep talking about our school. You asked me to explain what it is. The Tech Academy is a boot camp style training organization. And this is a relatively new thing in the adult career education field. It started out about four years ago in the San Francisco Bay Area where three developers, software developers, who had a little bit of time in between jobs and had some buddies of theirs who wanted to get into the industry, it got the, a, a wild idea, why don't we have these guys you know, quit their jobs and work with us for the next three months straight, 60, 70 hours a week, and let's see if we can at least turn them into a, a good enough developer that they can get on the job that we're doing and help and provide value. And it worked. It was an experiment at first. Almost everything is, but it worked. And that's called Dev Boot Camp. They're down in the Bay Area. And since that time, you know, that made a lot of news. I mean, it made a lot of impact. Since that time, there's been about 100 to 110 developer boot camp style training companies that have sprung up in America. They've been around for most of that time. I first started doing this about three, three and a half years ago. 
And the way our program works is that we create well-rounded entry-level software developers. And what that means is a software developer, a person who writes programs for computers, who has a really solid understanding of the fundamentals behind how technology and computers work, and is also armed with the current most popular say, computer languages or technologies that are used to do the job. So when he gets out there on the market, he gets snapped up really quick and he gets a job. But it also will find that two, three, four years down the line, when technology shifts as it just inevitably does all the time, mm -hmm. that they can keep up with the changes really well because they, you know, we instill such a knowledge of the fundamentals of the industry. So that's in a nutshell what we do. There's a lot more to the program. It's incredibly effective. I quote a chapter and verse on you know, our, our, our statistics, but that's what we're doing. When I say the school, that's what I'm talking about. Now, you're so true about how technology is ever-changing, and anybody mm -hmm. who decides they want to set up, let's say, an Internet-based home business realizes there are a lot of people out there with pickaxes, saws, and hammers <laughs> that they're willing to sell you that help you elevate potentially to that next level. For instance, anybody who's uh, set up a website for a business, you know, a home-based mm -hmm. business, there are a lot of people out there that promise search engine optimization, you know. Right. Well, you know, that's sort of almost a thing of the past because new technology today seems to be circling around, interestingly enough, back to you actually have to standing in front of somebody, shaking their hand and really saying, hello, how are you doing? <laughs> and that's very encouraging, but all the little changes in technology, especially around the language side, you have things such as Twitter and Facebook, and it goes right. on and on, but... It seems like every other day somebody's creating that hip application that goes on the iPhone and so forth. And mm -hmm. you're talking about really submersing people into this where they say, man, I understand the language now more than I ever thought I could, yeah. and now I can do something about this. Absolutely. Not, not only can you do it right away and go out in the marketplace as it exists right now and get a job and really contribute on the job, provide really good value, and get paid very well on it. You know, for it. I'll more on that in a moment. But not only can you do that right now, but it, it's so important that a few years down the line, you can still stay relevant in that industry, and you don't have a skill set that's so pigeonholed that when it loses popularity, you're left high and dry. That was a very primary concern for me when I was creating the curriculum for the school, is that we equip people well for a good, long-term, successful career, not to be a you know, highly qualified technician in a very popular technology that is used right now and will probably be gone within a few years. Mm -hmm. that, that matters a lot to us. You know, Eric, and I think that's such a great point to bring up for the listeners because everybody remembers back in the 90s you have the dot-com bubble. Certainly mm -hmm. there were plenty of stories, and I know I personally knew people like this who were in the computer industry just making crazy amounts of money. I knew uh, uh, one friend of mine, and she was in the computer business, and you wouldn't even know that she even knew this kind of thing just by talking with her, but she says, right. you know, the money is so ridiculous, and we just sit around most of the time in meetings. But she says <laughs> the scary part, and this is something that I also heard across the board, too, from people in the industry, is that they found themselves somehow downsized or surplused or whatever that right. word of the day is, it was impossible for them to find work anywhere else. So they were back to McDonald's at minimum wage. How do you yeah, go was, from $100,000 yeah. a year to something like that because something changed on you? Yeah, and it's an interesting thing. I've done a lot of looking at that time period, by the way, the whole dot-com bubble, because I, you know, I was a young adult growing up through that and being in technology. I never got myself trapped in any of those um, bubble companies, you know, like pets.com that's worth a quadrillion dollars one day and then worth, you know, a doggy bone the next day, right? <laughs> and not <laughs> even a dog wants to bury it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I never got trapped up in that, but I, I did watch it happen. And i tell you one thing I'm really, really happy with, with this industry as it's matured. And, and by the way, it's a really important point. The technology industry is really young. If you're going to go out and be a mason, if you're going to lay bricks, well, the technology behind that and how it fits into a modern society has been around for hundreds and thousands of years.
if you're going to go into the publishing industry, well, since Gutenberg, you know, arrived on the scene, there's kind of been you know that kind of an industry. Technology is about 60 years old. Mm -hmm. It's brand new. And so you look at a thing like the dot-com bubble, and it can be kind of scary. Like, how did all that happen? Well, it did. And almost every industry, especially when it has as much impact on society as technology does, is going to have these fits and starts. But what we're seeing in the technology industry right now is a maturity, a stable growth pattern, and in particular, for those people who are well equipped to know the fundamentals, uh, a, a place that someone can navigate a really good successful career and shift from one role to the next over a period of, of you know, five, ten years, and in every single one of them, be doing good work, be making really good money, and not have to worry too much about, about job security. By the way, I don't know that you know this, but the, the actual statistics are, from, from the Bureau of Labor and Industry with the federal government, that over the next five years, we are facing a shortfall of 900,000 technology workers in America. Hmm, interesting. This, 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 if you're looking for, for, for job growth, this is the sector. This is where it's happening. Mm -hmm. You know, and speaking on that issue, you know, we're about ready to come up on another presidential election, okay? Uh -huh. And that's one of the big areas they talk about is creating jobs. But do you ever notice they never say specifically what industry they want to create those jobs in or what the future looks like for industries that maybe they're alluding to? It's just... We plan on creating, you know, so many thousands of new jobs, but you're going to have to figure out what that is as long as you vote me in. Well, you know, I, I have – thank you for noticing that. I have a definite response to that. One of my observations over you know, 40 years that I've been alive is that when, when a politician of whatever stripe comes on the, the national scene and he's, he's to be elected, he'll, he, you're exactly right. He'll say a lot of things like that, right? They're a bit more general. What I've found is when you have a lame duck president, someone who's on their way out and everybody knows he is because it's the end of his second term like we have right now, <laughs> right, you very often find out where their heart really is. And regardless of where you sit on the political fence, I want to point to one specific thing. Over the last nine months, President Obama has singled out software developer boot camps and the technology industry as a whole as a primary area of concern for the federal government in terms of job creation and education. Mm -hmm. and, and so I, I will say this, that uh, one, I appreciate him very much for doing that because I'm in that industry and we do need people to be aware of it and, and recognize the resources that are there for them to transition into that career. But the second thing is I think that might be what he really would have said if we pressured him for specifics. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's, that's a minor point. The point is that it is now becoming a very, very known thing on the national stage that we have a problem. We have a problem in terms of technical talent. And by the way, the whole reason I started this school was because I personally couldn't find enough junior developers to work with me with my consulting company. Well, I would get new that? projects in, and I wouldn't be able to, I could handle the overall larger architecture or grand design, if you will, for a new software program. But I would need people to do some of the more mundane tasks, stuff that has to be done, and it's of great value, but it isn't necessarily where I would be putting my resources. Mm -hmm. I couldn't find those junior developers. So I decided to make them. Mm -hmm. And that's really where the school started. And it's grown into something much, much bigger than that. We have 85 students right now. We have graduated almost 50 people. Literally every single graduate has gotten hired in technology, and the average wage they're making is about $65,000 a year. So it's become quite a thing. Mm -hmm. And that isn't just a testament to our school, although I'm very proud of ours, but it just goes back to what I said. This is an area of great shortage of technical talent and it's also an area that needs every type of person in it, not just those, you know, put me in the corner so I can eat Cheetos with the, you know, my headphones in and, and write Things codes, like you, you see know? in the movie War Games. Yes, yes, exactly. Shall These we guys play could be game? a little excitable. <laughs> yes, exactly. The truth is that the technology, you know, people in the technology industry are just like people anywhere. They're just well, a wide variety of people. Yeah, well, certainly I can attest to that because, as I said, the friends and the acquaintances that I had over the years that were facing some of the challenges because of changing technology, as they kept saying, in the computer industry left them kind of, you know, well, this is my resume sort of thing. But you would never know they actually worked in that industry, you know. And so right. it's interesting how we kind of, oh, characterized what that person is that, that does that <laughs> kind of work now. 
Here's the interesting side. I was uh, it was interesting that it just came to mind as as you were talking here. Sure. We go back and and a lot of times when people look for investing in their retirement, so forth and so on, what you almost usually hear is. I wished I had invested in Microsoft or Apple computers. Okay? <laughs> I know, right? Now, I remember back in the 1970s as I was about to approach high school when I seen my first Apple II computer. I'm like, well, what's this? You know, It was <laughs> certainly different from anything I'd ever seen. And these kids were jumping on it, and they were immediately knowing how to do simple video games like maybe a tank explosive game or something like that. And yeah. I just never got into that at the time. And I think what had happened was this. I remember by my junior year of high school that a computer games course was being offered, and I thought that would be cool to do. So yeah. what do I do is I go ahead and I enroll in it, and of course it was the electronics teacher that was teaching uh, that course, which I didn't do too well in my freshman year in his electronics course because right. he basically sat there, and I was under the impression I had to know all this, and I didn't have a clue. But anyway, that being said, I get into this class, and one of the first projects they wanted us to work on was building a clock, you know, uh, on the computer. Right. And uh, he was talking about math and, you know, do you know this? And I never even finished algebra, for instance. I just couldn't, right. you know, get it. And he says, I don't think this class is for you. So I think that's what first impressed, that first impression of maybe this isn't an industry. I don't know that I'm that interested in algebra and calculus to go and do something like that. But Absolutely not. We're in a day and an age that that's completely almost unnecessary for what we're talking about here. But anyway, back to my Microsoft thing. Sure. Can you imagine that you go through this program that you have? Now you're not only equipped with the language, but now you have a passion for the industry as a whole. Yep. People who didn't invest in Microsoft didn't know the industry that well. They didn't have right. the language for it, the foresight. So somebody could have come up and said, I'm going to offer you a 1,000 shares of Microsoft, and how about at a dollar a share? You're probably going to go, well, what's a Microsoft? <laughs> exactly. But see, here going through something like this, you develop the language, and because of that you begin to see opportunities. So if you're someone who's looking to invest in technology companies, you're going to have a pretty darn good idea where to put your money. <laughs> yeah, you absolutely are. I think that's and, why I wanted to bring that up. And I, and I, I appreciate you doing so. It, 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 here's the thing is that technology embraces all of our lives now. And if, if you're resisting that change, I can understand why. It, it really does. Like people walk around, they're you know, stuck inside their smartphones and everything's digital and online privacy and all this kind of stuff, right? So. From a purely pragmatic point of view, you can almost look at it as <laughs> know your enemy, right? Like what is this thing? How do these computers work? How does the Internet work? How do we make them do what they do? Why does it seem like a computer is actually smart and intelligent, but at the end of the day I know it's just a machine. Like how does all that work? Mm -hmm. We cover that and so much more just in the first course. Mm -hmm. Our first course in the boot camp is called Computer Basics, and it strips away all the mystery and complexity and almost like it's only for special people to understand the nature of technology. Because the truth is, it's actually quite simple. When you break it down to its component parts, it's quite simple. But it's one thing for me to say that and go, okay, that's fine, Eric. You've been programming computers since you were like an 11-year-old nerd. <laughs> I, you know, I'm, if you're 40 or 50 or whatever, and you're thinking about a career transition, that's not going to help you much. But what does help is if someone took the time to break the subject of technology down to the individual rather than forcing the individual to try to assimilate the entire subject as a whole, well, then you'd be doing them an incredible service. And that's what we've done. That's, our, that's one of our goals with, with our program is to break down this entire subject to its most fundamental parts that anybody can reasonably understand, that you don't need to be you know, a, a, an algebra, math, nerd, geek, right? If you don't mm -hmm. because, again, if you're bright, and nice and willing to learn, you can figure out anything. Mm -hmm. But someone's got to make sure that the subject has been made easily accessible. And that is one of the challenges about technology. It has been for a long time. The people in it make some very fundamental mistakes when they're trying to educate others in technology. And I've been doing it for so long in the Navy and as, you know, as a business owner that I was well aware of the points where I had made the mistakes in trying to get across to people the fundamental 
fundamental nature of, the, of, of this, this whole area of study, and we don't make those mistakes in the program. And as a result, people can learn this regardless of their background. You know, and I will say, Eric, on your behalf, as we met, we sat down. I haven't attended the boot camps that you offer, but I remember just asking a few basic questions, uh, and you mm -hmm. began to show me, well, this is what this means. And it really changed. I thought, wow, you know, I think maybe I can do this. So I can tell the listeners out there, you know, I'm just a radio broadcaster guy. But look, you know, that was because of just even that few minutes we sat and you say, hey, take a look at this. This is what this means. Uh, really, you know, and, and I began to see the language and get at least a slight grasp of it, and that's very exciting. I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can talk to you about the, you know, and, and I, know we, I know we need to end off pretty soon, but I, I could I could talk about the the technical aspects of what we do and how we've organized our program and what you know that sort of thing. But at the end of the day, the reason that I'm personally motivated by this is because it helps people. Mm -hmm. It helps people. I could tell you story after story about changes in people's lives that have happened because they've gone through the program. And, and that's a lot more exciting to me than, okay, yeah, they happen to make a lot of money. Okay, mm -hmm. that's awesome. You know? mm -hmm. uh, we had a guy who had, had worked for 17 years in technology. He worked for Microsoft. He was an accomplished professional, but something came up with his family. He had to go take care of that. And about five years later, he's trying to come back into the industry, and he can't get a job. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have the current skills. He went through our program. He's a great guy. Absolutely wonderful guy. He got through the program, and where before he'd been trying to get a job for nine months, he got hired before he was done with our program for $110,000 a year wow. by Cambia Healthcare as, mm -hmm. as an executive for them, like a, a team lead. It was like, and his life utterly changed at that point. Mm -hmm. So I can tell you more and more and more. There's beautiful stories. But that's actually what motivates me about this. So if, if you're looking for, for a career that, is a great way to, yes, handle your financial needs and have some stability and job security and that kind of thing. Great. But recognize at the end of the day that when you prosper, when you're personally doing well in your career, how many more people can you help? How much more effective can you be in your life? And, and that's the kind of stuff that gets me jazzed. You know, and I think the clarity to add to this, too, for our listeners out there is simply this. Uh, we all remember the story of the great gold rushes back in the early turn of the century of uh, America. As, Bill, a San Francisco yeah, as a San Francisco 49ers fan, I'm well aware of what you're <laughs> <laughs> But the point is, it was funny because here are all these people basically giving up all their, you know, just uprooting themselves and getting rid of everything they can and search for panning and becoming rich, finding gold. But most of the money during that gold rush was made from people selling the tools. <laughs> yep. And this is something that I've been saying pretty much regularly is, Let's learn what the tools are and learn to sell those more than buying the tools to go out after that elusive gold nugget that seems to get away from most of us. Yeah, the gold rush is long over, but Levi Strauss <laughs> is still here. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, before we go here, what I want to do is have you touch on what people should look for when it comes to a technology training program. Well, you're gonna, here's the thing, and I've, I've put a lot of, a lot of um, thought into this. And it comes down to a very succinct philo philosophical difference. There's a type of st a style of training called top-down and one called bottom-up. Top-down training takes a person and utterly immerses them in the subjects they're going to do with very little preparation, and they're forced to use it and figure out a bunch of things as they go along. That's top-down. Mm -hmm. Sort of like trying like to get that. somebody to become an airline pilot. We're going to put you right in the cockpit. and Exactly. Well, if you can keep it in the air, then we're going to get you a certificate. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Bottom up, though, would actually address it from building blocks of fundamental after fundamental after fundamental, gradually increasing in the complexity and, and functionality of what you're learning to the point where you're a master at the end of it, but you can easily assimilate it. Now, if you already know an area of study, you can do the top-down approach pretty easily and add in one more related aspect of it. If you're already a computer programmer and you want to learn a new language, throw yourself right into it. But if you don't know the area at all, it's an incredibly overwhelming experience to try to assimilate all of it all at once with a top-down approach. Hmm. We have a bottom-up approach, and you want to make sure you look for this in kind of a, a training boot camp if you're, if you're not familiar with the technology industry. Do they stress fundamentals? Do they build 
one after the other on the basic blocks of data that you're going to need to be able to do the job, or do they just throw you into it and hope you do well along the way? Some of you might make it. Many of you won't. We don't like that approach. Absolutely. Now, uh, the other thing, too, is before uh, we let people you know, know how to find you and so forth is, uh, with your particular program in your school, which is located in Portland, Oregon, um, mm -hmm. are people able to do this boot camp even without being on location? Absolutely. Okay. Actually, um, a significant portion of our students are remote. They're in Washington, D.C., or Texas, or Alaska. The entire program can be done remotely. You're hooked up with your own instructor that leads you through everything in the program. It goes quite well, actually, and we love that. So yeah, we have a brick and mortar installation down here in you know, Southwest Fourth and Oak in downtown Portland. And we have a lot of students here, but we have a lot of students that are remote as well. Well, very good. I know that will be very encouraging for the listeners out there that think to themselves as they've listened to this, and I'm sure there will be some motivation to say, well, geez, if a radio broadcasting host says he's learned something from this without having all the mathematics <laughs> and so forth, maybe I can do this too. And that's one philosophy or at least thought that I like to leave with our listeners is, Look, if somebody else can do it, so can you. The question is, what kind of commitment will you make to doing this? And if the right thing is in place, you'll find it to be easier than you thought it was. And is that usually Absolutely. the case with your school? It is. People are constantly amazed for the first three or four courses that we get feedback like, I, I can't believe that I can learn this, that, that it's that <laughs> easy and it's going so well. It's very you know? exciting, isn't it? Oh, it's, it's fantastic. As school it's should be. <laughs> Personally, it's tremendously gratifying. I, 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 I love it. And by the way, I want to stress one other thing that's unique to our program. There's very few um, programs we found in America that are like this. You can do our program part-time. You don't have to quit your job and do it 40, 50, 60 hours a week. You can do the program part-time, which mm -hmm. opens it up to all kinds of possibilities. Mm -hmm. There you go, and you can vibrate into your own niche when it comes to the technology industry and find out where you actually belong versus going into a nursing program or becoming a naturopath, which are all great exactly. things, but who wants yeah. to be a quarter of a million dollars in debt to get out there and heal people? You're going to be pretty sick by the time that all happens, I would think. <laughs> exactly. Now, go ahead and give out the website where our listeners can find out more about this. Absolutely. They can go to techacademyportland.com, T-E-C-H-A-C-A-D-E-M-Y, Portland, techacademyportland.com. See now, and, and in the words of Eric Gross, uh, uh, listeners out there, if you can spell that and type that into a Google search bar, you can do this. <laughs> really. That's We're great. not saying That's it's easy, great. but you can do this, and we really <laughs> encourage you to do that. Eric Gross, thank you so much for joining us here on the program today. My pleasure, Daniel. Thank you very much. You bet. We want to thank you, the listeners out there, for tuning in and dropping in your emails and letting us know what you think about the show and all that. We always encourage your thoughts, comments, and questions. You can visit us at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. And also sign up for our free weekly e-news updates. Also follow us on Twitter at Beyond 50 Radio as well. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. And remember, live your day past halfway.